And once again, thank you, Jan and Florian. Welcome to the center stage, where our first talk today will be by a NEOS core team member. And he has been a core team member for lots of years. It's probably more than 10 years now. I guess. He has taken a long journey from Cologne, taken a break from playing volleyball or the guitar. And as we already heard, the first talk on this stage will be about NEOS 9. So please give a warm welcome to Bastian. Hello, friends. Ah, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. And I hope you're having a good time. So I'll be talking about NEOS 9. Um, but to be honest with you, I'll mostly talk about the elephant in the room, the event source content repository that has been a topic for so many years. And like Sebastian, I'm really excited that it's slowly getting real. And um, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'll try to uh, convince you uh, that it's worth all the long wait and effort. And I'll go do so by going through these uh, three main aspects that Sebastian already showed in the keynote. Um, so brace yourself. I'll rush through quite some material. Um, but rest assured that everything I'll show you is uh, documented. And the last slide contains a, uh, a URL with uh, all the links to the resources. So starting with stability, and of course, that's an important feature of every system. And while NEOS is known to be reliable and uh, stable in general, uh, I think most of you who work on it on a daily basis, especially with more complex projects, uh, have seen the content repository in a state where you didn't know how you got there, or rather, how your clients got you there. Uh, you couldn't easily recover from, or in the worst case, even lost data to, to a corrupt state. And uh, with NEOS 9, uh, most of these uh, states just won't be possible. But uh, of course, it will still certainly contain bugs, especially in the beginning. But it comes with uh, some core characteristics uh, that make us really confident that they will be easier to fix and that we'll get a much more stable system in the long run. And so first of all, there's the event stream. That is basically the unique source of truth that contains an event for every possible change to your content. So in case something goes wrong, you can always refer to that perfect audit log, uh, see where it went wrong. And then uh, most of the cases, we can fix the bug, and you can replay through the stream, and you're good. Or you can travel back in time and go to a state where everything was as it was expected. And then we have an extensive test suite uh, with currently about 6,000 uh, unit tests and a lot of functional tests. And they are quite useful because they're really fast to execute. I think just a couple of seconds for the unit tests. Um, but with NEOS 9, we especially focus on BHAT tests like this one. Um, and we currently have about 500 scenarios like this. Most of them are actually more extensive, um, performing 10,000 assertions. And this gives us, uh, gives us a great confidence because um, they basically test the, the observable behavior end to end. So we can really refactor things under the hood uh, or implement new features in a truly test-driven manner. Um, so let me see. What's the next? Oh, yeah, library. That's, uh, um, well, in the course of, the, of creating the new content repository, we drastically changed our uh, architectural style away from this global framework thinking uh, to more dedicated decoupled libraries. So let me show you. So instead of this um, global content repository singleton we have today, uh, we created this decoupled library so you can instantiate multiple instances. And like Sebastian said, that will allow you to create dedicated or to use dedicated content repositories for each site with their own 
node type configuration and dimension configuration within one installation. But you could also use it to manage uh, assets or customers or basically anything that can be stored in a hierarchical, potentially multi-dimensional manner. And because the core of the content repository has just a couple of dependencies, it can be used or it will be possible to use it in every PHP project. And I think this is quite remarkable because as far as I can, <laughs> as far as I can remember, this is the first time that we provide a substantial tool that can be used outside of the NEOS universe. And I'm, I'm really curious to see how that works, uh, works out. So then there's the new kit in town, the content repository registry. Ah, that's a mouthful. <laughs> uh, that's going to be the new thing that you inject and uh, use to get hold of any concrete content repository instance. And lastly, uh, the new content repository will come with a really neat and, uh, neat and type safe uh, PHP API. Uh, uh, Bernhard will cover this in his talk tomorrow morning in depth but I'll just show you one example to, um, to compare to today's API, or rather non-API. And so let's assume we want to find all child nodes recursively and then filter them by their type. So today there's uh, multiple ways you can go about. You could use the node API um, and inject that node type constraint factory and then use the find child nodes method, uh, but this will actually only work on the direct ch child nodes, but we wanted the, all the descendant nodes recursively. So then there's the node search service that allows you to recursively go through the no nodes, filter them by the node, uh, node type, but you'll have to specify a search term. And also, uh, it does some weird things under the hood, so the, the behavior is not really well-defined, uh, for example, in what order you get the nodes back. So. Lastly, there's the flow query way that is used by Fusion under the hood, but that's not really meant to be used in PHP either. It's um, not type safe at all. You, either, uh, you even have to tell the IDE to ignore the types, and then every third-party package can uh, change the implementations of these operations, so it's not very reliable, to, and mostly it's really slow. So as a last resort, you could use the node data repository uh, and then convert the results back to nodes, uh, but that's uh, explicitly not part of the public API, and it even says do not use it outside of the content repository package. Uh, spoiler alert, it is used outside of the content repository package, <laughs> but it should not, but it is. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's see how that same example looks uh, today. So we can inject that content repository registry that I just mentioned for example, with a constructor injection like this. And then from there, you can get the content repository instance. Um, and NEOS 9 will come with a pre-configured default content repository. So let's assume we want that. And that will be your single point of interaction. So every mutation to the content has to go through this instance. And it provides access to all the read models that allow you to, uh, to query the state of your content repository. And the most important API for reading is the subgraph, um, the content subgraph. Uh, again, Bernhard will probably cover this uh, tomorrow, um, but for now, just remember this will be your bread and butter API if you want to query for nodes. And because it's so common, there's a shortcut so that allows you to get an instance from any given node. And then this subgraph uh, provides a lot of find and count methods um, actually quite a lot, and the one we're interested in for this example is the find descendant nodes, and that you can pass the identifier of the entry node and then give it an optional filter, and that filter allows you, for example, to filter for the node type. So this would be the full example with NEOS 9, um, but just to show off, I'll go through the other attributes you could filter for. For example, you can specify a search term that will search through all the property values, but you can also filter for specific properties, and that property value filter actually even supports a complete DSL, so you can formulate complex queries like this one. And then you can 
order the result uh, by any timestamp field or by any property value or a combination. And finally, you can paginate the result. And these kind of filter options are available for um, all of the finder methods. So you can use them for finding child notes, siblings, or re references. And it will always be condensed down to a single database query. So it's, it's pretty fast, too. So speaking of fast, next up, performance. And performance is one of these buzzwords that can have multiple aspects on its own. So it could mean scalability. So uh, you know, all, the, all of us know these software projects that start off really simple and fast. And before you can look, they grow into these complex, slow, and unstable beasts. Or they just break down under the actual load once they're put into production. And NEOS 9 uh, will uh, s require only PHP and MySQL by default. But as Sebastian already said, we'll, we will be able to use Postgres, which allows for some really nice optimizations under the hood. And also, due to the better separation of concerns, you will be able to scale horizontally much more easily. But performance can also meet, uh, mean the speed of uh, your development team. So how fast are you in uh, implementing new features and fixed bugs? And frankly, uh, with NEOS 9, there will probably be a, a bump in the uh, development speed because we all have to get used to the new concepts and APIs. Mm, but thanks to the uh, much cleaner API, I'm hopeful that it will give us a huge boost in the long run. But of course, mostly if we speak about performance, what we mean is speed. And NEOS 9 will be faster in many aspects out of the box, um, also because it shifts a lot of the heavy lifting to um, asynchronous processes, so the perceived performance for the user will be better. Um, it won't be faster in every aspect yet, um, but it comes with at least one performance superpower, um, that's projections. Um, and this is basically the main ingredients of event sourcing. Uh, it's basically a materialized view uh, on your data that is, uh, is optimized for read performance. So let's say, for example, we wanted a really performant way to count all the nodes in the system. It's not a very realistic example, but just for the sake of simplicity. And uh, the next slide might either help you to grasp the concept or it could completely confuse you. <laughs> Let's see. So we'll have that event stream that contains an event for every change to your content in the order they appeared. And then for every projection, we have the projection, projection logic that is executed for every event we come across. And then usually those projections persist their state so that when you want to query for the state, you don't have to go through the whole process again. So if we start that simulation and we come across the, uh, an, a node creation event. So we increase the counter by one. And then we come an, across another creation event. So we increase it again. Uh, in this projection, we are not interested in any updates. So we ignore those. Or we don't do anything here. And for the node deletion, we decrease the counter again. So we now, at this point in time, there's one node in the system. But more importantly, we know at any time, point in time, how many nodes there were in the system. So that's the gist of it. And that same example in code will look like this. So every projection of the new content repository will have this catch-up method that gets the event stream passed. And then you can uh, iterate through the event stream and uh, update the state accordingly. So the new content repository will come with these four uh, projections out of the box. Um, most importantly, that content graph projection that I mentioned before. And then NEOS will add uh, three additional ones. Uh, the change projection is there to uh, keep track of unpublished changes in a workspace. So we can render that orange or green publish button, basically. And then the asset usage projection is, uh, allows us to really performantly tell uh, whether an asset is used in the content repository and, and where, so we don't accidentally delete it. And then the document URI path projection is used for the routing. And I'll 
take that as an example to show you how a projection can tremendously speed up the system. So let's look how the routing looks like today. We have that notorious front end node route part handler. Um, <laughs> and this extract is responsible for the part that uh, matches an incoming request to the corresponding node. And I want you to focus on these two lines especially. So for every UI segment, um, we find all the child nodes and then compare their uh, URI path segment property with that segment. And you can imagine how slow this is, especially if you have like a lot of nodes on one level, which can be the case, for example, if you import your product catalog to NEOS. And you might think, well, this is all cached. That's true, but uh, first of all, it's really useful to optimize for the uncached behavior too. And also, this code is still executed for every new URL it comes across. So if you, if you would keep appending characters to the URL, you would always execute this code before you get presented with the 404 uh, not found page. And also, uh, resolving a node to a URL is equally expensive today. So if you render one page with a lot of links in the navigation or some glossary, uh, that's a killer. So this is a look at the persisted state of that document URI path projection. And you can see uh, for every full URI path, we store uh, the corresponding uh, node identifier and its point in the dimension space. Uh, so matching a node is just a matter of a really simple database lookup uh, and the other way around. All right, that's it for stability and performance. Um, uh, those are, of course, really important, um, but uh, the real fun comes with extensions. So I'll use the remaining time to go through a couple of new features uh, and examples that show you how you can uh, use and extend NEOS 9. References, they have been around for a while, and they're really useful because they allow you to relate nodes to each other. And because they're so important with the new content repository, they will be a first-class citizen. So let me show you what that means. Uh, let's say in the, in the NEOS demo site, uh, we extend that chapter node by uh, property characters that allow you to reference uh, the mentioned characters in that chapter. Nothing new so far. So with this example, uh, the new or well, the reference editor will appear in the inspector, and we can link up those nodes. But what is new, there's a new flow query operation references that you can use in an eel expression to get a reference, uh, to get all references of that uh, given node. Or you can just get the ones f with a specific name. But the important difference is that this won't return the target nodes, but it will actually return the references themselves. And this is important because with NEOS 9, uh, those references can have properties on themselves. So in this example, we could store the page numbers where the character appears in the chapter. But I'm, but I'm sure you can come up with much more useful examples. Um, the, the UI does not provide uh, support for that yet, uh, but I'm sure the editor will be extended soon. Um, in this example, we are interested in the nodes. So we can add this here and then uh, iterate through them to render a link for each item. And with that, no surprise if we switch to the front end and scroll down to the end of the page, you see those two characters linked. Um, but the great thing is because those references are now stored in a separate database table, we can basically look at it from the other side. So we can tell for every node where it was referenced from. And this is called back references. So there's a similar flow query that you can use in EL, iterate through the result, and with those seven lines added to the detail page of those characters, if we go to, go to it, you'll see that this character where in which chapters it was uh, linked from, or in which chapter it, it appears, actually. So this is rather powerful, and it was only possible with the help of Elasticsearch and the like before. And my bold claim is that you won't need Elasticsearch for 
most of the websites in the future due to this feature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's 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 not that we don't like uh, Elasticsearch. It's just that we don't like additional complexity. Uh, 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 and I think so because of that feature, but also because of that really powerful PHP API for the graph, and also for because of projections for the edge cases. So thanks to Sebastian. Uh, this is already fully documented, and I said, as I said, I'll share the links later. Uh, next up, property scopes. Uh, they allow you to keep properties in sync across multiple dimensions. Um, so let me show you. Again, we're in the chapter node, and they, the chapters, they all have this image property. And by adding just one single setting, we can scope this property the, to the whole node aggregate. And in case you're confused by the term node aggregate, it just means all the variants of this node. So in the demo side, um, all languages this node ex uh, exists in. So with the setting applied, if we were to um, translate a page, usually when we create the copy, you basically create a detached copy and all the properties you change uh, will only live in that variant. But because we scoped the, property, uh, the, the image to the whole aggregate, now if we change that and we would go back to, the, to English or to any language, actually, you'll see that this image is now reflected there. And um, yeah, this is also really powerful. This was only possible with, with the help of third-party packages before, but now it's built in and um, allows for some great features. It's also supported for... Um, for references, of course. And there's one different mode uh, that allows you to keep the property in sync for that node and all variants in a more specific variant. So, for example, if you have uh, UK English as a, and US English as a fallback, US would propagate to UK, but not to the other languages. All right, again, this is all already documented, and you can have a look today. And I think, well, we're always almost at the end. So to finish off, I want to show you three examples of custom packages that I created that show you how you can extend NEOS in, uh, in three different ways. So recently, I stumbled upon this uh, mark when. I don't know if you heard of it. It's, it's this markdown-like syntax that allows you to create uh, interactive timelines. And I thought this is pretty useful, and it might be a good example for a simple projection. So this is what I created. I won't go into details, but just to get a sense of it, this is most of the projection code that is, uh, logic that is needed. And it will store that state just in a single JSON file. And then there's this uh, markwen CLI command that allows you to render it into a timeline like this one. And then you can see, well, at what point in time a node was created, edited, disabled, and uh, yeah, you could also render it into a calendar view. Don't know why that should be useful. <laughs> <laughs> In general, actually, to be honest, I don't think it's very useful at all, uh, but it's, it's on GitHub, and it's, it's there for you to dissect, and uh, it's a good example on how to create a custom projection and how to register it with NEOS 9. <laughs> right, the next example might be a bit more useful. And uh, for it, I want to pull up this graphic from before um, because it reminded me that uh, a digital asset management is actually a really good fit for a content repository because we can use the hierarchy of the nodes uh, to represent folders and we can use uh, references for tagging. Um, so I created this um, as a proof of concept, to be honest, uh, this package that configures some custom node types for all the different asset types, folders, and tags. Um, and then it provides a high-level API that allows you to, well, manage assets. <laughs> and because it only has a few dependencies, again, it can be installed in any PHP project. And uh, that includes older NEOS versions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I also created this little bridge package that uh, registers uh, this content repository with, uh, um, with the registry. And it also provides some custom 
GraphQL resolvers for the new media UI. So now, if we look at the uh, 8.2 installation, I think it is, uh, with the new media UI installed, and all these assets you see, they actually come from the content repository. And it supports all the features of sorting, um, filtering by type, uh, even the latest not productive uh, feature of uh, hierarchical uh, folders and tags. And of course, you can also search for assets. And as you can see, is, this is running on my local machine in dev context, so it's rather, rather fast with about 1,000 assets I, I imported. Um, so this is, uh, I said, just a proof of concept so far, but it, who knows, it might turn into the new media UI, uh, media, sorry, the new media package um, at some point. But for now, it mostly serves as a good example how you could uh, put a dedicated API in front of, of the content repository. So you, you'll benefit from all the nice features, but you still have a very domain-specific API. And that pattern with the two packages, I hope that we'll see that more in the future, where we create the core logic in a really framework-agnostic uh, library kind of code, and then we have that adaptive package that makes it available to the world of NEOs. All right, I'm not sure how time-wise, but I think I'm slowly running out of time. But for, uh, to finish off, I'll, I'll have a little treat for the real nerds of us. And this is uh, a package that uh, provides a backend module that allows you to write custom projections in JavaScript uh, uh, in the backend on the fly. Uh, and uh, so some of you might recognize that syntax. It's actually the one from the event, source, uh, event store DB. And uh, I created two ones already. So the left one, it will just count all the uh, events, uh, a bit similar to the one we saw before. And the right one is a bit more sophisticated. It uh, aggregates all the events by the weekday they appeared and then counts them. And we can create another one that, uh, that will count the most popular node aggregates, uh, sorry, node types. And as you can see, you get this nice editor with syntax highlighting. And we, we even get uh, code completion. And with that in place, so now if I hit, if I hit play, it will stream about a thousand events from the backend to your browser, and then for every projection, it will start up a dedicated web worker that will execute that projection logic. So, how long do you think that will take? I'll show you. One, two, three, go. So it takes about one second, which I was actually quite surprised. And you can see we have about 1,000 events. Uh, the most popular node type is the text node type. And your editors were mostly active on Sundays, <laughs> which, is no, which is no surprise, because I was the editor in this case. <laughs> All right, that's also uh, on GitHub for you to dissect. And uh, that's it from me. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't be scared. Thank you so much, <laughs> Bastian. So, uh, you know, I have lots of questions in the last head, in the last couple of months for you and Sebastian. So I've brought some with me today. So don't be scared. There are some. But if you have more questions where, uh, during this uh, conversation, please just submit them. I will ask them. So let's get to the first one. Which concept was the most difficult that needed to be created for the content repository? Hmm. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh, I think the, the whole, you know, that whole thing of eventual consistency in general is, is something that you first have to wrap your head around. So because we're now we're used to if you change something and then you ask it back, you just get the changed version. But with CQRS, that's not guaranteed. And to cater for that in the whole system was not easy. So for now, for now we, in a lot of cases, we block uh, until all the projections are up to date. 
So for the user, it behaves like it was uh, immediately consistent. But that was, I would say, really hard to wrap our hands around. OK. Oh, there are com uh, coming questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yes, if I'm happy I like it. <laughs> um, how will the asynchrony impact the editor in the back end, or will it at all? Yeah, like I just said, so um, most of the time, at least for now, we just block the request from the UI. To, uh, so it seems like uh, so you, you'll, when the command goes through, that you can rest assured that you get the new state afterwards. Um, but again, the, now with that basis, there will be lots of opportunities to optimize. Uh, I remember that Robert had this uh, plan years ago already where we thought, oh, it would be nice even if other editors do something that you get, uh, um, well, you get a notification if you're working on a similar content area and or that the content is synced between multiple uh, computers. And this will all possible now. Um, because uh, we have a much m better way of, you know, knowing what ha things happen in in the time scale. Okay, let's look at the next one. I think we have still time. Yes. Is there already an integration for a working history module, including restoring old states <laughs> and log of changes by editors? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's the event stream. You can always <laughs> look at that. No. Um, uh, yeah. Well, just in general there, I have to admit there are uh, some fake news out there uh, saying like, oh, wow, we get a, an audit log for free and we get under and redo for free. That's not true, unfortunately. Uh, but it will be possible and it's much easier to do now. Uh, at the current state, I think the history model is not yet reworked, but this will be rather trivial. I mean, I'm saying that, but I, I think it's... Uh, we can also make it much powerful, actually. So I think we go with this one. Uh, if you go back in time, how can you replay all the events after that point? Yeah, so um, yeah, when I mentioned before that you can basically go back in time and restore any state, currently that still uh, requires some manual work. Um, but I see great potential for really useful developer tools. Side guys, I'm looking at you. <laughs> um, um, but we have that replay commands that allow you to, well, also, you know, if, if uh, lo and behold, you find a bug in a projection code, you can fix it, and then there's a command to replay each projection individually or all of them. So that's catered for. So uh, if we are already on the command line, does the concept of node migrations completely change in NEOS 9, or is the the same as always? Yes and no. <laughs> it <laughs> changes uh, to the better, I would say, uh, because uh, previously we mostly had that node repair stuff, but now we have a dedicated way to uh, one separate way to fix inconsistencies and another one to actually perform um, migrations. And those node migrations that we know that syntax will mostly be the same or really similar. So you'll be used to it. Okay. I think you will have to answer questions afterward when you are off the stage. Yeah, feel free to approach me <laughs> anytime. So you can touch we, have, we, have time for, for <laughs> we have time for some more questions. Yes, which one I didn't ask. How well does NEOS 9 really scale? A NEOS instance with million mod nodes that get updated daily could take up a lot of space, isn't it? Ah. And eventually slow down without hardware upgrade. Mm. That's a good one. Uh, so honest answer, I don't really know, because uh, when I said before it will scale much better, we are most certain that it will, but it was not, of course, not really tried in, in production yet. But um, so that question of the events piling up, of course, that comes up because usually you never change an event when it's, once it's written and you never delete it. Um, but first of all, uh, just having a single list of, of columns in the database uh, scales really well, even with MySQL. Uh, it's really fast to read. Uh, it takes some space, but that's usually not an issue. I mean, space storage is, is cheap nowadays. Um, but we also think about uh, a concept that allows you to compact 
the event stream. So for example, let's say if after a while, you, of course, you have lots of events because you know, if you change a headline five times, you get five individual events that could be condensed down to just one. And uh, we already have some concepts in mind where you can, uh, well, for the export that will be required where you just produce only the events that uh, make up that current state. Uh, but we are thinking of something that allows you to, let's say, I want to condense the event stream, uh, but I want to keep all the events from two months ago. So you can still have the whole history there, but then get the best of two worlds, really. So we have uh, not a history mo module, but you m mentioned exports. So this one is already working with a new... This is, yeah, this is working. The export format is different than the, the one from today because we actually export the events into a one JSON file um, and, of course, all the assets and stuff. Uh, it's much more powerful, actually. So I guess I have a last question from this stage. Uh, for data projection reasons, I might want to drop the history of a node but keep the last state. How is that this achievable? Yeah, that's one of the frequently asked questions. Um, uh, well, probably through a similar concept that I just mentioned with the compression, when we, um, because we won't ever change any written event, but we can uh, copy a stream and write different events and then discard the old stream or even delete it. And with that, of course, you can uh, like anonymize any critical data. But to be honest, I would say in a content management system, it's quite unlikely that you publish something that is really highly confidential. Well, well of course, if, especially if it's not used for a content management system, but for anything else, uh, that will be the way, of course. Yeah. So I guess that's from me for you for now. <laughs> thank you. Bastian, thank you very much. And before, before you go, please remember to rate the talk in the app so that we have enough votes at the end of the day tomorrow to award the best talk to our speakers. Thank you very much for posting your questions in the app. Please continue to do that throughout the conference. And as you heard, we will ask the speakers. And Bastian is still around. So if all those NEOS 9 concepts and content repository questions are still formulating in your minds, go talk to Bastian and Sebastian and, and all the others. Um, to get your questions answered. And uh, I think you are still here until the contribution day. No. No? no? <laughs> what? I'm sorry, I have to leave tomorrow so, evening. Uh, yeah. All the NEOS 9 uh, questions will have to be answered by Sebastian and Bernhard. I think they are up to it. <laughs> They're up to it, definitely. <laughs> so. Oh, all right, and as you have seen in the schedule, the next talk on the center stage will start at 12. So there is a break now. And after the next talk, there will be the lunch break. So thank you very much for coming to this talk. Thank you, Bastian. And see you back. Thanks.